it's a challenge these days to find joy, to find something along, along, you know, get ourselves grounded and centered and something that we can hit the refresh button on each day that feels alive and new and fresh. Hopefully today is that reset button for you all. I remember that morning, as many of you do, September 11th, 2001. I was just starting my second year in seminary in Berkeley. I was also working full-time in a banking career. I was also working half-time as a youth minister for a Methodist church. But in reflecting on that crisp, clear morning in the Bay Area, it was clear that our country had changed radically in shocking ways. It also brought it to my mind something crystallized, became extremely clear. Theology matters. Our orientation to God matters. How we understand God matters. It makes every difference in how we navigate the world, our orientation to something larger than ourselves, it points out and can point at its best to something that is holy, that is sacred, that resides within each of us. And if it's wrong, if we get it wrong, we can desecrate it. We can use it in evil ways. Now, don't get me wrong, this attack was carried out by religious extremists, was sold as a holy war. It was not the first time that that has been used, and I'm sure it will not be the last. But to frame anything as holy, we're getting off on the wrong footing here. And this is where I want to dig down a little bit deeper on what is truly holy, what is sacred, what is wisdom, and how can the light of truth shine upon that which is currently in darkness. Some of those are residing within us as our belief systems. We can always entertain something that maybe is an improvement. Something that is, if we understand our information about our relationship to God, is not completely full yet, but we're open to it. We can learn a bit more. We can add it. We can include it. We can bring it into our daily existence. Obviously, there are a whole lot of people around our planet that could use a bit of a bit of an adjustment and understanding that not only is better for us as individuals, but us collectively. And just to underscore, not to spend the entire sermon on 9-11, but for me, crystallizing that moment was our beliefs, our orientation to God and what God is matter, and they matter all the time, every day. And we will continue to navigate these murky waters of our belief systems and how we live that out in every day-to-day -day interactions. And this is also where we, we start to dig in on the discernment, the wisdom, to deepen our relationship to the living God, to divinity. And here's another question. How do we know if something is true? How do we know if something's true? Well, let's see. I'll unpack a little bit from the wisdom of Solomon here and the title of today's sermon. For she is a reflection of eternal light a spotless mirror of the working of God and an image of his goodness. Although she is but one, she can do all things. And while remaining in herself, she renews all things. So we're talking about wisdom. And in the sermon teaser, I was reflecting that wisdom transcends gender identity. It's referred to as a she, and then it's a he. It's both. It's an and. It's inclusive. 
It's not an either and or. Our minds love either or. It's either this or it's that. It's black or it's white. The new paradigm, the way God operates, the way that wisdom operates collapses that. It is this and that. It is both. It is and. It is not a period. It is a comma. Here's another one. If you learn nothing else from today's sermon, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Knowledge, wisdom. It is both, it is and. So that's something as a takeaway from today. You can be making a fruit salad. Now you know. You're welcome. <laughs> and while that is true, wisdom is a bit more than that. She is a reflection of eternal light and can do all things. And I want to reflect on this for, for a moment. It goes back to our ability to remain spiritually grounded, centered, to feel that oneness with divinity. And I'm going to read here from A New Earth. I had this book since about 2004. It's a story about the past that we carry with us. And it does relate to the next section from our New Testament. Carrying the past, the inability or rather unwillingness of the human mind to let go of the past is beautifully illustrated in the story of two Zen monks, Tanzan and Akito, who were walking along the country road that had become extremely muddy after heavy rains. Near a village, they came upon a young woman who was trying to cross the road, but the mud was so deep it would have ruined the silk kimono she was wearing. Tenzan at once picked her up and carried her to the other side. The monks walked on in silence. Five hours later, as they were approaching the lodging temple, Akito couldn't restrain himself any longer. Why did you carry that girl across the road, he asked. We monks are not supposed to do things like that. I put the girl down hours ago, Tanzan said. Are you still carrying her? Now imagine what life would be like for someone who lived like Akito all the time, unable or unwilling to let go internally of situations, accumulating more and more stuff inside. And you get a sense of what life is like for the majority of people on our planet. What a heavy burden of past they carry around with them in their minds. Now I use that as an illustration, not only for all of us and what we carry around and what we let go of, but this isn't new, this is wisdom. This is something that's been here for thousands of years. It's been part of our human conditioning, the human condition. Who am I? Is the question that Jesus poses to his disciples. But before we get to answer that one, Jesus is set against the backdrop of anticipa anticipation for what the Messiah was to be for the Israelites. And this is in the heart of the gospel story. We know the birth, we know the, the end, the death of the crucifixion, the resurrection, and here we are where it's still not quite complete as to what Jesus was here to do. He was not even known by his closest friends, those that were disciples, what he was really about. And it was in this moment of great anticipation for what the Messiah, the anointed, was to be, where he's faced with this powerful and poignant moment, trying to teach his disciples the entire reason for his coming into this world. And we all have experience and experiences in our life where these moments we question ourselves, we question why we're here, what are we, what are we meant to do here? What is our purpose in life? 
And we might even ask a secondary question. Was it worth the sacrifices that we've made? What sort of difference did I make in the grand scheme of things? Now, this is the moment situated here in the gospel story I read to you. And it is with the knowledge that his earthly ministry was coming to an end. His public ministry was only about three years. That's not a whole lot of time in terms of how we measure our own life. Three years, we could probably all see where we were three years ago. See where we are now. And yet it is here in the heart of the gospel where we have this, we enter into our scripture reading this morning to understand something of importance of the Messiah. Now, first of all, they're in Caesarea, Philippi. It's a fascinating place historically, especially for this gospel story to occur, because it was outside of Galilee. It was outside the rule of Herod. It was under the rule of Philip. But not only that, in the older days, it was called Bellinus and was once the center of worship for the Old Testament God of Baal or Baal. Yes, that golden calf that was worshiped by the Israelites. While they're wandering the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years with Moses, when he was gone too long, they started to go back and worship Baal. To this day, the town where this took place, this, this moment in the life of Jesus with his disciples, it's called Banias, which is also a form of Panias. Now, it's called Panias because up on that hillside, there was a cavern that was said to be the birthplace of the Greek god Pan, the god of nature. And from a cave on the hillside, there gushed forth a stream that was held to be the source of the River Jordan. So you have this rich historical context for where Jesus is in this moment, speaking with his disciples and asking them the question, who do people say that I am? It gives also some context for what was there in the beliefs and the minds of those that were there. Baal, Pan, the River Jordan, these are all highly symbolic in history of the world. There's a sense of urgency here. Jesus and his mission here on earth to communicate something of prof profound wisdom. And this is the difference in all of our lives, breaking it down to what this, how this relates to me, to you, to why we're here. The first question Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. And I won't go into all the history of that, but people that in this time, they understood that the Messiah was going to be preceded by the return of Elijah. Their understanding of who the Messiah was going to be was going to be a military leader like King David that was going to take them to great conquests. They were going to rally behind him. They were not prepared for something that was more profound, more powerful, and lasting a couple thousand years later where we're still trying to figure this out. The second question is the most important. He asked the disciples, but who do you say that I am? Now I want to spend just a moment there because it really doesn't matter what I preach or say and try and convince you. This is your moment of opportunity to accept that into your life. And if it's real, then it's real for you. And if it's not, then it's not. Maybe you're still deciding, you're still discerning. But that is the real question. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have about something. It's 
kind of like honey. Someone could tell you all the things they say about honeys and where the bees went and they got pollinated by a, an apple orchard and taste like honey. But if you haven't tasted that honey yourself, it's all secondhand knowledge. So Peter answers them, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And to this day, that second question will remain the more important question in our own spiritual journey. And we can answer it in various ways, things we might know about this or that. But God is always relational, always in relation with us. And if we are gaining more insight, knowledge, depth, in that relationship we can become, we have that opportunity to become that spotless mirror of the working of God. It is in that relationship and through that relationship where we craft our inner spiritual poise that we can continue to navigate this world. And if we're not there yet, a simple trust in God's presence with us always can go a very long way. I'm going to read something from Rohr about how we might be able to do this in our own daily lives. And it's, in, it's called Simple Trust in God's Presence. And this comes from uh, one, of, one of the writers, Cynthia Borgo. Simply says, prayer is talking to God. And with these words, nearly all of us receive our first religious instruction. Certainly I did as a child. I learned the usual first prayers and graces. Now I lay me down to sleep and God is great, God is good. Followed a bit later by the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. I was also encouraged to speak to God in my own words and instructed that the appropriate topics for this conversation were to give thanks for the blessings of the day and to ask for assistance with particular needs and concerns. But for all of this, I was also one of the relatively rare few who also had it patterned in me. That prayer was listening to God. Not even listening for messages exactly, like the child, Samuel, in my favorite Old Testament story, but just being there, quietly gathered in God's presence. This learning came not from my formal Sunday school training, but through the good fortune of spending my first six year school years in a Quaker school, where weekly silent meetings for worship was an invariable part of the rhythm of life and schoolwork or recess. I can still remember trooping together, class by class, into the cavernous two-story meeting house and taking our places in the long, narrow benches once occupied by elders of yore. Occasionally, there would be a scriptural verse or thought offered, but for long stretches, there was simply silence and in that silence, I gazed up at the sunlight sparkling through those high upper windows or followed up a secret, a secret tug drawing me, drawing me down into my own heart. I began to know prayer much deeper than talking to God. Somewhere in those depths of silence, I came upon my first experiences of God as loving presence that was always near. And prayer is simple trust in that presence. Almost four decades later, when I was introduced to centering prayer through the work of Father Thomas Keating, it did not take me long to recognize where I was. In a deep way, I'd come back home again to that first place that I knew as a child in a Quaker meeting. What I know now, of course, is that the type of prayer I was being exposed to during those meetings for worship was contemplative prayer. In Christian spiritual literature, this term all too often has the aura of being an advanced and somewhat rarefied form of prayer, mostly practiced by monks and mystics. But in essence, contemplative prayer is simply a wordless, trusting opening of self to the divine presence. Far from being advanced, it is about the simplest form of prayer there is. Children recognize it instantly as I did, perhaps because 
as the 16th century mystic John of the Cross intimates, silence is God's first language. So the invitation today, my friends, to be comfortable in stillness, in silence, to dwell with the sacred. And if we succeed in those endeavors, may we all become a re reflections of that at one eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of his goodness. And in that silence, may we know and feel God directly. And then we become wise. May the Lord so help us all.